A very warm welcome to you. Many thanks for joining us on this week edition of the program. We remain your source for all the latest happening in the world of business. My name is Susan Ubiako. On our lineup this week, first, we join Faith on the CEO rendezvous for the concluding section with the Director General, Edo State Health Insurance Commission, Dr. Rock Amego, who spoke on the effort of the Governor Obaseki led administration at providing affordable health insurance for residents of the state. According to him, service is key in any health insurance scheme. Take a listen. Health is business. It's business. It is it must be enticing to the eyes for the people to enjoy it. And so, if you go to a facility, you must see someone who's well-dressed, who's clean, who speaks well, that's going to tell you, oh, what do you want? What can we do for you? You know, it takes you across the journey map. And so that's why we are setting up these QIP teams across our facilities, so that they can also bring this business sense, this sense of service, this sense of duty, this sense of diligence that Governor Basaki is trying to preach across the spectra, across the agencies and, 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 and parastatals of Edo State. So service is key. On this edition, also, we bring you ICSAP from the 2024 INSPEN Online Retirement Summit and unveiling of Insurfield Initiative at the Radisson Hotel Ikeja. This summit, which was attended by players in the insurance and pension sector, was organized under the theme Retirement Without Tears Through Insurance and Pension. Let's check out highlights. Mm -hmm. in your language they call that that desk that you are sitting on it will see your end ask yourself how confident are you about that future if you're not so confident about that future you don't have to plan with someone that opinion right the most awful part of retirement is loneliness i can show you the only thing most people say about snow that said five years of work you buy insurance is insurance for vehicle, government vehicle, insurance for building, you know those ledgers we feel. It's, it's something very, very, it's not personalized. What more can I say than to urge you to sit back and enjoy the lineup? A very warm welcome to you. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the CEO of the World. On this edition of the program, I have the honor and privilege to be sitting with the Director and General of the Dostic Health Insurance Commission, Dr. Rob and Mego. Together, we'll be looking at a fantastic job this commission is doing in a Dostic Fence. We're still very much served the planet and to join us. So, how do you ensure that those who are your providers over the year, the last um, uh, years that you were. Have you ensured a strict compliance to what you have promised and what a release that gets it at the point of contact with the other So, um, again, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> when I hear some questions you ask, it almost seems like you're in the insurance business yourself. Of course. You know? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, um, Knowledge is ever improving, all right? We're ever learning. And so we're ever dynamic and we're moving. 
Well, when we started, we knew that we couldn't do it alone. We are not omnipotent, so we can't be everywhere. You know, it's only God can do that. At the same time, it can be in every, every place. We did an implementation research, so to speak, across our facilities, took a quantum of people, you know, just to hear their feedback on what was happening in the facility. So most of the challenges we got at the time was that they were giving them inferior drugs. They were not giving them branded drugs. They were stuck out of drugs. Um, you would get only paracetamol when you get to the insurance. And we, we asked ourselves, we, we are not there. What can we do? What is the next alternative or possibility to closing this gap? And so um, we were having a lot of, you know, thoughts back and forth on how to bring the pharmaceuticals in, all right? Because we know that there's also a level of care that they can give. And so that just quickly incited what we could do at that time. So we quickly engaged the pharmaceuticals and made sure that they could give out of stock drug, drugs when people go to the facility. So if you're an enrollee, you go to the facility and they tell you there's no drug, there's no this, you just take the prescription. It's yours. You have a right to know what your prescription is. No matter what the doctor tries to scribble, you ask your doctor, what is this? He will tell you what it is, even if you are not able to read it. So that prescription, we engage. Like from... <laughs> oh, sometimes, many to... times. No, many times, we are not able to read what doctors scribbles. You know, they paper. just scribble. Maybe they have 20 <laughs> or 40 people to see. They just keep scribbling. So anyways, we engage our end release to say that that prescription, take it to any of the impaneled facility, pharmaceuticals across the entire local government. Of course, our website is in the public. People can just quickly check the facilities available within their areas. And so pharmaceuticals began to give um, these drugs, these out-of-stock drugs that we're finding within these facilities. And before you know, the health facilities began to sit up. We, we stopped seeing out-of-stock in facilities, knowing that you're going to get to go to another facility to take the drug. And in the end of the day, if you were expecting, say, five Naira claims, we might not see it from the claim you're expecting. So people are always afraid to lose something. And so because they were afraid to lose you know, that X amount of money from lack of drugs, they started stocking their facilities. And today we have almost less than 1% out of drug within our scheme. Okay, uh, Doctor, I know also in, in, in the ecosystem, sometimes we find uh, that people also, I mean, I will this by people like in England, this, this just to be the very far by the heart of money, they get to a facility. I mean, our personality is the same generation most faces. They get to a facility. Before I even met people there, I was at a facility sometime. Um, this guy came. I was waiting to see a doctor. You can't be and read me. And he walks up for us and said, I need to see the doctor. And I go, oh, oh, just sing down the words. And so, you know what he said in my days? In my life, I didn't be having my days. I had a walk thing to give us. We told him. So, what I'm saying that is, you also find an MOB sometime overdoing. <laughs> They just want to complain just because it's, it's a health insurance in my facility. They want to walk in there. They don't get me for our meeting. They want to be attended. And if they don't get that, because they have the mindset, I paid for the service and I need to do that. They don't get that. They go back. So, so these people are bad. They are not providing the service you are paying for. I found out that are sure. And the next you was some kind of So what's what? what? Uh, th thank you again. It's, it's, it's a very common occurrence, all right? Um, you see and release actually many times harassing our health service provider because there's an entitlement, there's a consumption hazard syndrome, if you like, all right, because you're already deducting money from their salaries or they are paying you out of pocket. And so they spend the whole world to bow, bow to them, you know, so that's also there. But again, we need communication, communication, communication. So one of the things that we also did across our facility, we put patient's bill of rights and um, health service provider bill of rights so that everybody knows what they're entitled to, you know, their wage period, what they're supposed to do. And, and that has really helped, all right? Um, again, um, this, I told you of the quality improvement team where we have patient um, enrollee positive experience. All right, so across the facility, those desk officers who are the enrollee positive experience officers are supposed to be able to alleviate or mitigate against some of this, you know, phenomenon that is occurring within those people who have come to the center. Okay, I'm a physician, for example. I'm a family physician, all right? I, um, I did my training about 10 years ago. When you come to a hospital, the first thing you're supposed to do is to triage the patient. People walk into the hospital, they're looking healthy biologically, but there's something wrong psychologically. There's something intrinsically wrong, all right? Somebody walks into the hospital, for example, I give you a very simple story. His blood pressure is 240 over 160. He looks well. 
he looks well dressed, he's coming in a tie and suit. And then after the records officer, you know, checks his blood pressure, immediately takes him into the consulting room whilst other people are seated there waiting. Those are people, they don't understand. And they need that man is an enrollee. Oh, they say, oh, because it's from HMO, they, they've given him preference. <laughs> because, you know, but, but again, I talk about communication, communication, communication. Because we lack some of this communication, we create bad perception in the minds of our enrollee. And so if our desk officers, in quotes, who are supposed to be our enrollee experience officers, they're supposed to be within that place where we are seeing our patient. You can go, when you see somebody agitated, you can go to explain to them, Madam, Oga, this is what the problem is. This man has come with this um, uh, emergency and he needs to be treated first. You know, sometimes when you explain some of those things, it's some of them, yes, yes. Some, some of them to accept, but some of them, it aggravates them. But on a by and large, a lot of people would accept, you know, if you, if you just try to explain to them in a calm tone. All right, I have noticed that you cannot always control the reaction of people, but you can control the action. You know, when somebody reacts to you, you it's easier said than done, but yeah. if you practice it, it becomes a practice, you know, it becomes part of you to say, oh, I'm sorry, sir, we're attending to this person because he has such an emergency, we'll attend to you shortly, you know. All that, it would, even if we gave you 100% anger, it will reduce to at least 50 or 40 percent, all right? I so so, so <laughs> I, across our facility, we always encourage communication. We encourage communication. We are not top-notch. We are not there yet. But the banks are doing it, all right? You go to a bank, they'll tell you these are greeters. That's what they do. Zenith Bank, for example, started it. You see a beautiful lady or a handsome man standing in front, well-dressed and saying, good afternoon, sir. What do you want us to do for you? I mean, health is business. It's business. It, is, it must be enticing to the eyes for the people to enjoy it. And so, if you go to a facility, you must see someone who's well-dressed, who's clean, who speaks well, that's going to tell you, oh, what do you want? What can we do for you? You know, it takes you across the journey map. And so that's why we are setting up these QIP teams across our facilities, so that they can also bring this business sense, this sense of service, this sense of duty, this sense of diligence that Governor Basaki is trying to preach across the spectra, across the agencies and, 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 and parastatals of Edo State. So service is key. Once we are doing that, once we continue to improve on that, you see that people will begin to trust the government. At least it will start from one sector. It will begin to be a ripple effect and spread across other sector. Then once you trust in your government, it's like a positive phenomenon. It's like a positive feedback. When you tell a child he's doing well, he wants to do more. You know, Governor Basaki is doing well now because he has done well in some other sectors. People are hating him. And so that, I'm sure that's one of the driving forces for him to, to incentivize him. To say, oh, I can't feel this part telling me I'm doing well. And so for us, is we're also having an example to look up to a mentor to say, oh, if this man is doing well, if this man is paying his salary before on the 26th, we can't owe our claim. So if you look at all the health insurance in Nigeria, for example, our state is the only state that pays within 30 days. And that's because we have a mentor who is doing that same thing. We can't flounder. If he's doing that, we want to even be better than him. And so we look up to him to say, if he pays salary every 26th, we must pay our claims within on the 30th. A lot of countries who have health insurance, even Britain, they don't pay their, their, their insurance till about three, four, four months. But because we have somebody who's doing that, we are making sure we catch up. And so that has also worked for us. Everybody needs an inspiration. Again, I thank him for being our inspiration in this particular light. Okay, finally, Doc. So I roll with um, um, a well-funded system, excellent customer service and all of that. Uh, there's a way that is fits in Nigeria, right? That's an, uh, I think uh, is that health sector nurse, you may take it in a big for all that bad and happening. So I just want to really have in your perspective to what extent long that also um, affects um, in the health and the insurance movement commission. Oh, okay. Um, you see, I, I must be honest with you. The Jabba syndrome is affecting every spectra. It's affecting all of us. Um, again, um, when I think of the Jabba syndrome, it, um, it reiterates my resolve to say that there's God. God is just helping us. Why do I say that? Africa has 24% of disease burden in the world. And we have only 3% of manpower. This was calculated sometime three years ago. So with this exodus of people living, that will be less now. So if you do, um, the last WHO statistic was that it's one to, I think, 14 or 15,000 one doctor to 15,000 patients. And the, what is supposed to be per population is one to 600 in, in developed world. So if you look at the discrepancy, it's, it's, you can only say that God is helping us. What God is helping us, we must also help ourselves. What have we done with the health insurance space? We had to leave the traditional way of delivering healthcare. 
all right? We don't have many doctors, we don't have many nurses, they are living in the country. Now we have engaged frontline community workers and community extension workers. We have also developed a software for them. Like I told you, most of our governance processes are driven by technology. We've also developed a software for them that they can use to examine, access, and you know, take a history from our patient where they don't do any harm. All right, so based on the symptoms that the patient is telling them, the software is telling you what are the possible diagnoses, all right? And so this possible diagnosis probably for some of these, um, you know, over-the-counter treatment that you do, some of these, our community extension workers can do that, all right? We've engaged, recently we engaged about 750 of them at the level of the primary health agencies. So they go out there to do immunization, they go out there to give health talks and health promotions, um, they go out there to treat some, some small illnesses based on you know, um, what you can do to not cause more harm. All right, that's, that's one way we are covering some of this manpower gap. Secondly, we're also doing telemedicine now, all right? Um, in some of our facilities, about six or f seven of our public facilities, we're doing telemedicine where um, it was started by the Association of um, Physicians in America, um, Association of African Physicians in America. We do the free healthcare sometime two years ago. And so we set up this telemedicine. And so it had a lot of traction again. So from about, from about these six or seven private uh, public facilities, our enrollees go there at a specific designated time and they speak to our doctor virtually, all right? And then um, the nurses within the ecosystem or the lab people now give them the next line of action on what to do. Um, apart from that, um, when these our community health extension workers go into the nooks and crannies, the rural areas, they have to reach area, I told you that they have a device. Some of these devices are connected to some of our doctors now. All right, they were connected to the doctors who were particularly handling the telemedicine. But we are beginning to draw a framework where we are working with the hospital management board and the primary health agency so that these community health extension workers, if they get to an impasse or a brick road with these enrollees, with our patients, they can speak to a more skilled doctors who probably do not, do not, does not reside in that area. All right, so that's another way we are plugging the gap. Finally, how are we plugging the back of manpower? Across our facilities, all right, we have about 236 facilities and paneled on the health insurance scheme, private, public, and pharmaceuticals uh, diagnostics. Across our facilities now, um, there's, there's, a, we can, there's a provider network where they can communicate, all right? So um, if you go to a primary health facility, for example, who doesn't have a doctor, and she's able to tell you, oh, I saw someone who has a suspected appendectomy. She's talking to, of course, our call center room. And we, at the back end, we look at our profile. We say, oh, the facility closest to you is three kilometers, it's four kilometers. There's a surgeon there, you can go there. So whilst they are preparing to take the enrollee there, our call center has already called the people on the other side to say, somebody is coming to get you, please. Can you have the surgeon ready because it's an emergency? Or can you have the surgeon ready or the, the uh, consultant ready for a particular day so that that person can come? So this communication also reduces the time that these patients have to wait, all right? It also helps the, it also helps efficiency of the system. Again, I say that at those states we are lucky. We have a lot of schools that are churning out medical people. We have our school of nursing. We have our school of technology, all right? A lot of states do not have that. And again, what had happened in the past two years, you know, we have various um, institutions here. We have more than seven private institutions in, in in Edo State, you know, with accredited medical facility to treat, to train nurses, to train doctors. We also have our public facilities, you know. So for us in Edo State, we are lucky. When the ASO was on strike, some of our private facilities, the Brindle universities, they are churning out doctors, all right? Those are universities now have just started. They'll be churning out doctors and nurses and the likes of it. So for us in Edo State, we are extremely blessed, more blessed than other states. So we have more capacity to churn out medical um, uh, practitioners, what we should think of doing, what we should do, is to find a way of retaining them as well, all right? Of course, um, immigration and immigration has been there since the beginning of time. We cannot fully stop them, and there are no laws to stop them. So what we can do is to bring out something who, what is interesting, financial incentive, non-financial incentive, to attract these people. So um, we try to communicate across our ecosystem. As long as you're a medical doctor or a medical personnel, we try to collaborate with the insurance so that we have a pool of people who are also readily available to give some of some of the services that they can give to whether you're a public person or whether you're a private person. 
we are working with the NMA now who can also advise us on those who have the requisite qualification, the facilities that have the requisite licenses to do that based on what the regulation of the Ministry of Health is so doing. So this communication helps us bridge some of those gaps. But I must tell you, it's a challenge, but because we are working extra hard to do it, it's been able to, we have been able to plug some of those challenges, not enti in its entirety, but at least to some reasonable extent, you know. Now let's check out excerpts from the 2024 and Spend Online Retirement Summit in Lagos Happy Viewing. Planning for retirement and our new chapters goes beyond just financial security. It's about cultivating a vision for a fulfilling future that extends beyond one's career. This summit focuses on unleashing resilience, a concept that perfectly embodies my father's story and the message I want to share with you today. Many of you, like my dad, may have overcome numerous challenges and dedicated yourselves to building successful careers. But as you approach retirement, consider what will define you beyond your work? Who and how will you continue to influence for good? This is what I call unleashing resilience. It's about adapting, growing, and finding new ways to thrive even after we step away from our traditional careers. The experts who will follow me Today, we'll delve into the financial nitty gritty, so I'll, I'll keep away from numbers, Val. But before we get there, let's explore what a truly fulfilling retirement might look like for each of us. As we saw with my dad's story, retirement can be a time of unexpected change. While he achieved immense professional success, the loss of my mom forced him to confront a new reality one where his work-centered identity no longer provided the same sense of purpose. My dad's experience highlights a common challenge faced by many retirees, and how to function as a human being, hopefully. It's just that you need to find your new groove. Studies show that many retirees, they miss the structure, the daily challenges, and the sense of accomplishment that work provided. But here's the good news. Retirement isn't the end of your journey. It's a chance to rewrite your purpose. Think about the skills you've honed throughout your career. Leadership, problem solving, communication. These are valuable assets beyond a typical workplace. Let's broaden our horizons and craft a game plan to use our skills for a personal mission. How will you continue to make a positive impact? So today I want to explore five examples. Example number one, you can deepen your existing passions. So don't wait until your last day to scramble and figure out what you want the next chapter to look like. Give yourself time to explore possibilities, experiment with new activities, and build a fulfilling retirement vision. Ask yourself, how confident are you about that future? If you're not so confident about that future, you don't have to plan with Sam and Papa Finance. Right? I encourage you today to sit down with any of our financial planners that can help you in articulating the plan towards that fulfilling life that you like to live. There are different plans. Different plans that can help in achieving those dreams. And the beauty of insurance relative to other financial instruments that also help towards achieving your goals during retirement is that insurance provides not just the investment, but the security also. That whatever your dream is, if your eventuality happens before that retirement time comes, that dream that you do have can be achieved. And the dream is not just for yourself. You know, the good book says, a good man lives in inheritance for his children's children. So let our children not be our insurance. Go to school, 
School is a period that is for a short period, and you look forward to it. When you start work, work is also for a period. It's not indefinite. And you should look forward to retirement. And when you are in retirement, that's the last phase of life. And that's the longest part of it, depending on the grace that God has given each and every one of us. And I pray that God will give us the grace to live long and enjoy our retirement life. That's our time on the program this week. Many thanks for your company. Do keep a date with us, same time, same station, next week for a fresh package. In the meantime, feel free to connect with us on all our social media platforms. You have tons of videos to watch on our YouTube channel, Almond Finance TV. Click, subscribe, and watch. Easy. <laughs> My name is Susan Ubiako. See you next time.